Welcome one and all to Last Stop Penn Station podcast featuring Carrie Silken and Ian Riccoboni. They dive deep into Carrie's wealth of stories and no subject is off limits. From the world of wrestling to his ticket agency, growing up in New Jersey, drug-fueled underground days, hustling in the French Quarter of New Orleans, and endless days and nights in New York City, every story is worth telling. Welcome, everyone, to another exciting edition of Last Stop Penn Station. I'm Ian Riccoboni, and our guest of honor is Carrie Silk. And Carrie, my brain is fried. The election, this is election week, and uh, as of press time, we're not quite sure what's going to happen, although it looks like we're coming down the, the train tracks here. Yeah, very exciting. I was talking to Mike G last, before the um, results started coming in, and uh, Mike's a huge sports fan he's like oh this is great tonight you know i feel like it's a it's like sunday you know like a super bowl <laughs> right. but uh for my uh side of the fence it looked like it was going to be a blowout mm -hmm. i think that I could i don't want to speak for you no absolutely yeah we're, I, we're uh on the same side it felt like a roller coaster and uh it felt like one that wasn't going to stop <laughs> And yeah. Um, you were watching it with Sarah. Yeah. And I was watching it with AJ and uh, I was getting real down. Mm -hmm. And AJ uh, was a keep the faith kind of is, is a keep the faith kind of guy. And uh, I, I turned in at 1130. I'm like, yeah. whatever's going to happen. And uh, when I woke when I, I got up at six in the morning and I didn't. It wasn't going to stay up, but I put on the TV and at six in the morning, there was still some there was there was some newfound hope. I can't remember the specifics. Milwaukee turned in their counted their ballots and turned them in. OK, that, that was it. So when I got up at 10 in the morning or 930 ish, immediately put on the TV and uh, the hope kept rolling during the course of the day. And uh I don't want to jinx anything, but it's looking really good. Yeah. And uh, this is being recorded on Wednesday night. So if we have president elect Joe Jorgensen on, on Friday, by the time this <laughs> this launches, <laughs> then don't blame us because we we may not be able to see through the outcome and uh, keep keep our phones off <laughs> during this. So we won't we won't be getting any text alerts. If no there's text any, alerts. If there's any breaking news. TV's off. Um yeah, they, we need we need some change in the country. Um, I've seen a I've seen a lot of presidents. Uh, you know, as a kid, as a little boy, I remember they let us out of school at two in the afternoon when Kennedy was shot. Oh wow! Killed. Um, and this was back in an era when my school was about a mile from my house my grammar school. So in the morning, there was like a carpool of mothers that would take like four or five the kids from the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the weather was decent or like even, I'm trying to think, even as long as it wasn't raining, mm -hmm. um, we would walk home from school. So when they let us out of school with the Kennedy thing, what was, I was uh, eight years old. I was like, the, the president got shot, but it didn't it didn't register on an adult level mm -hmm. until I uh, till I came back to my uh, house and you know saw the reaction from my parents, and that that's a whole I could turn this into a whole podcast. But I lived through Kennedy, I lived through uh, Johnson. Uh, too young to be able to really understand what he was about. Um, lived through the Nixon era as I was a teenager, going on to Carter, going on to Reagan, uh, Bush Sr., Clinton, so on and so forth. And I've seen a lot of elections, um, 
did I really, this was definitely the most engaged I ever was in an election. I was mm. engaged in the one in 2016, but as I've outed myself in the previous episodes, I didn't vote. And, uh, but this time I did. Um, but this is the craziest, eh, this could be argued, but for my lifetime, this is absolutely the craziest political times I mean, you're not a little kid. What do you think? Yeah, this is uh, this is the wildest I can remember because even, you know, being very little, Bill Clinton won two pretty decisive elections and the things just kind of felt normal. And uh, I remember George W. Bush winning the, the Florida recount. And that was strange, but it's still everything still kind of felt normal until 9-11. And then. Uh, the win against Kerry. And this is, you know, I caution people who say, well, it takes some time. You know, why well, why can't we know that night? We didn't know in 2000. It took 36 days to figure out who won that election and how to go to the courts. And we didn't know in 2004 for a few days because Ohio had provisional ballots and, and recounted ballots. So these things take some time sometimes, and especially with the mail-in, you know, the high percentage of mail-in ballots this year because of the pandemic. <laughs> uh, you know, this this was unusual and it does feel like everybody's digging their heels in the ground and it doesn't feel like there is compromise. Uh, we had one of the least successful legislatures in the history of the United States in terms of passing bills. Well, when you mention the uh, 2000 and 2004 elections where it took time, mm -hmm. I don't really remember that. I sort of remember it was a done deal. Now, you, you could uh, school me here. I remember that Bush, the, the big question was Florida. Mm -hmm. And uh, with Jeb Bush there, what did it take a month to, to, I just don't remember. Yeah, it took about 36 days. And there was some questions about the, the hanging Chad, <laughs> whether or not some ballots would be <laughs> would be counted. <laughs> was that one of the items you used to carry around the village during your sex education? Something uh, that I'm not even familiar with? The hanging Chad? <laughs> oh, I mean, first of all, it's award-winning sex educator. Second of all... <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no, I don't think anything had hung. No, I take that back. In the New York University uh, Health Education Building, and we're going off topic here, but there was a swing uh, that would be uh, not demonstrated, but <laughs> made available as something that you could do if you were open, uh, if you had an open mind to things. You know, and it's great. It's great. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, it's great because it's it's low gravity. It's low impact. You can do anything. Hey, lamb chop. Lamb chops in the house. <laughs> I, you know, it's the, the swing. I, I don't know. I, I'm huh. I'm a pretty liberal person with that sort of stuff. And how, I don't know, a, but... how did this turn it? <laughs> I turned it into that. But that's OK. It, it, it's probably better. People would probably rather hear about this than than uh, the political landscape. But uh, well, I've got a point. I've got yeah. a political. I, I had to ask AJ this. You know, I remember things. Better from the 60s and 70s and than I do from a short time ago. I didn't remember that uh, John Kerry was Bush's opponent. I couldn't remember the 2004 opponent. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to ask you yeah. or our producer, AJ, who ran against Clinton in 96? Uh, that was Bob Dole, the okay. great senator from Kansas. And he was soundly defeated, I believe. Sa yeah, that was a, that was a blowout. Uh, Jack Kemp. And Bob Dole were that okay. ticket. And uh, Perot, you know, sometimes people say Perot played spoiler. At one point, 92, he was ahead, way ahead in the polls. Uh, and uh, he had dropped out. He stopped his campaign and then he restarted it in like September in 92. And then 96, he came back, but didn't really go full throttle with it. Um, so, you know, maybe that kind of predicted Trump or someone like Trump, kind of a charismatic a rich guy that, you know, exudes confidence and, you know, because a lot of people think if, if Perot would have stayed in the 92 race uninterrupted, he just stopped at one point and then restarted. He would have had a shot. There was no third party candidate that had any. There was someone they kept showing from 2016 that had like one percent, two percent. Gary was? Johnson. Right. Um, but there was nobody on this on this current election that we're still 
looking for the decisive win or two. And I wonder what would have happened if there was one of those one, two, three percenters in there. Yeah, that would have been interesting. I think it would have prevented uh, Biden from going over 50 at least. And who knows the consequence in each individual state? It's tough to tell. Um, I guess it would depend on how that person was aligned. There are some people that point to Jill Stein. I don't think this is necessarily true, but Jill Stein was the Green Party candidate in 2016. And some people say, well, oh, if, you know, if the Jill Stein voters would have only voted for Hillary. Well, maybe, you know, but who's to say they just didn't like Hillary or Trump and they just wanted somebody different. And can you imagine that back in the 60s, I'm going to get my years wrong here, but Barry Goldwater. 64. From Arizona. Yeah. Who was a uh, very bigoted, Mm -hmm. uh, extreme right wing, got a large percentage of the vote, not to mention... Was it 68 with George Wallace? George Wallace, is, he won. He got 20% of the vote. A, the last third party to have, to have certify <laughs> the here's, electoral votes. Here's yeah. a man that stood in front of, uh, was it the University of Alabama? What, what state was he from? I think he was, yeah, he was from, the, from Alabama, I believe. Right, yeah. stood in front of the University of Alabama when the first black students, uh, it was segregated and the first, they, the first black students were allowed to come, but as governor, he stood there with militia trying to block this, and he got 20% of the vote. Crazy. It's insanity. It really is. And thankfully, uh, I think things have improved since then. I think, like we've talked about, I think there's still work to do, though, in terms of uh, in terms of that sort of thing. I think this has bring, brought out the worst in a lot of people, but... There's an interesting piece of for me where now I, I, I kind of know it because it's come to the surface and I've had kind of my own reckoning. And we've talked about this where it's more in plain sight in some cases now. So it's easier to identify it, this idea of racism and and uh, things like that. It's not as hidden anymore. I was told I don't want to I'm going to leave his name out, but uh, someone who has a very popular wrestling uh, audio show. I have had a conversation with this gentleman, and uh, he's a, a Biden supporter. And we're going to, I think the people that listen to us are pretty much on our side of the fence. There might be some uh, Republican or Trump fans, and you're welcome to. But during our conversation, I was the one that said it, and he wholeheartedly agreed. Um, if you're, if you support Trump, in my mind, you're a racist just based on his, yeah. the things he has said. It's for me, it's it's not necessarily that you're a racist, but you are rubber stamping his racist behavior. OK. And to me, that's that's almost as bad. You know, you got to keep you got to keep your friends and family in check. You know, if, if I was doing something destructive or if I was being offensive or if I was being bigoted, I would hope somebody would pull me aside and say, hey, Ian, you know, you know, that really hurt or that really, you know, that really sucked. You know, don't don't do that. Don't act like that. You really hurt that person's feelings. I had that experience recently. Okay. And uh, earlier in the summer when there was uh, after the George Floyd thing, Mm -hmm. I was talking to our good friend Colt Cabana. Mm hmm. And I made a comment to him and uh, I said something inappropriate uh, as as, uh, you know, that it was in in the context of when there was this rioting and looting going on. No, I didn't use the N word or uh, whatever. I just said something that wasn't the right thing to say. And uh, he uh, text me a few days later or or did he just call me he called me and mm-hmm. said yeah I, I carry I, I I can't believe you know you said that and uh, I was saying it as a half joke you know was it, that's it, a good friend though that's a good friend to say right. hey you know what that's that it might hurt somebody's feelings if and he was right you know and I'm trying to say like oh well uh, what do you expect? 
yeah. and that wasn't that wasn't very cool. And so I, I, I too have to be kept in check sometimes yeah. with what I say and uh, what comes off the top of my head because uh, it's not always the right thing. Yeah, and that's that's where we learn. I mean, that's when we learn about folks that walk in different shoes than, than what we do. And you were just telling me that, uh, speaking of cult, you uh, got him involved in politics. <laughs> at, least, <laughs> at, least active, at least to be active. At least to be a voter, right. yeah. In 2018, he uh, he said, hey, how do, I, how do I learn to register? How do I how do I vote? And uh, we went, we sat down. We were in a hotel room somewhere. Um, trying to think. It would have been the summertime, maybe Nashville or Atlanta. And we went, we, we made sure he was registered. And... We made sure he knew where his polling place was and he was going to vote that uh, that fall in the midterm. So, yeah. And if I, I think if everybody reaches out, I think if we check each other and, and make sure that we're not even avoiding saying the wrong thing, but just that moment of, well, you said this and it's not cool because that's going to hurt that person's feelings because uh, the assumptions and the, you know, those sort of things, the stereotypes I think that's how we get. I think that's how we all improve. And uh, I'm hoping this election puts kind of uh, puts some water on the flames that have been stoked recently. And hopefully, yeah, we shall see. Well, that was uh, that was heavy, but that was fun. We got some sex toys. We got some racism. We got all the big the big topics here on Last Stop Penn Station. Well, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll switch gears and go to uh, Ring of Honor. Yeah, what, what a fantastic! You know, it was the this past with every Monday, folks. There's a watch party mm -hmm. where you could interact on Twitter with the stars of Ring of Honor, and at the same time, at no cost, be watching on the ROHWrestling.com website. Yeah, the ep the current week's episode, and this past Monday was the finals of the Pure Tournament, and I've been watching wrestling for 55 years, and it's it's not often where I'm really I'm really glued into something. Mm -hmm. If it's good, I'm glued into it. Yeah, and man, was this good with Jonathan Gresham and Tracy and uh, Tracy Williams. Yeah, they. I'll tell you what, uh, Jonathan Gresham is the best wrestler in the world right now, and I don't think anybody can convince me otherwise, unless your argument was that it was Tracy Williams. <laughs> and uh, you know, I Jonathan Gresham obviously comes out with the title and the uh, and the acclaim, but I think Tracy Williams opened up a lot of eyes in the tournament. Yeah, it was just such a good match, and uh, uh, Ian Ian and Caprice are being hailed all over the place <laughs> as the best, seriously, as the best commentators in pro wrestling right now, which is, and it's coming from uh, names like Jim Cornette. Yeah. And the uh, Dave Meltzerish types of the world. And yeah. uh, you should be proud of that. No, I appreciate it. And uh, it's true. And we also, you know, uh, this, you know, we've been having these great pure, these pure title, ma these pure tournament matches, but then we had that, Great six-man brawl. Yeah. Uh, you talk about people stepping their game up. Uh, Shane Taylor, just the continuous growth of Shane Taylor over the last three years, four years in Ring of Honor, uh, really cementing himself at the upper tier. SOS, you know, those are two young guys in their mid-20s that are ready to crash through and, and make a big splash. Uh, EC3, big star, comes to Ring of Honor. And... Uh, not on the same page as the Briscoes. I don't know what's going to happen there, but uh, he gave, he shot a look to Jay Briscoe after that. They cost them the match. That <laughs> man, if looks could kill, he would have he would might have killed Jay Briscoe. And uh, yeah, it's it's amazing what's going on right now. Yeah, and uh, besides the Monday night watch party, we have uh, the week to week with Quinn McKay. Amazing, amazing host. Yeah, we have the. Uh, the Bouncers Happy Hour. Mm -hmm. uh, every few weeks, Dalton's. Uh, who am I leaving out here? Dalton's Dalton Castle. The, Dalton's Castle. Kel uh, Kellyanne from Australia has been doing some great videos. Joe Hendry uh, from Scotland is doing uh, song parodies. If you buy his T-shirt, he will write a song for you. And some of those have been wonderful. All of them have been wonderful. Oh, I'd like a song. There you go. <laughs> so just uh, so a lot of amazing stuff. And uh 
diving deep back into the Ring of Honor catalog. We've been posting matches with Roderick Strong, with John Walters, with uh, the Briscoes from the from 2005 and Kenta and just the names. And those are all on Honor Club, but a lot of them are for free on YouTube too. YouTube.com slash Ring of Honor. So uh, just a lot of great stuff going on and uh, everybody's excited. There's going to be another taping carry and uh, there's a rumor that there might be a big event that week. <laughs> So maybe uh, maybe we'll have to get you get you quarantined to make sure it wouldn't be it wouldn't be final battle without you. I'll say that. Well, thank you. We'll we'll see what happens. I was talking to uh, Gary Juster, and uh, there might be some slightly lighter uh, protocol um, in regards to. It just doesn't appeal to me to be in a hotel room for four and a half, five days. You being a gamer, you, you, you being a, a, a social media, very, very active in social media, you get the time to fly. Um, but uh, I might have a rough time. I don't know how I could smoke a cigar in the room. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, our last episode with uh, basically featured all well, it featured uh, my experiences and uh, my memories of uh, Bruno San Martino. Yeah, got a lot of good feedback on that. Big hit. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Bruno. Uh, you can't go wrong with Bruno. No, no, and I could talk about Bruno all day. He's one of those guys that. Uh, I was just just before my time. I just missed him when he was active and uh, not. I mean, there's there's a little bit. There's the Larry Zabisco matches. There's some against Nikolai Volkov and against uh, against the killer Kowalski. There's a great match that's on tape. But other than that, not a whole, whole lot uh, on tape to really go back and watch. So the, 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 the stuff that's out there is mainly from his second run. Right. In the 70s. Uh, it would be so nice to see some of these. 60s uh, matches, um, you know, him against Gorilla Monster. When in, in their first run, mm -hmm. they had two, three match programs. I think they were in 64 and in 67 or 68 um, at the Garden. And uh, Gorilla Monsoon was a huge man. Yeah. And he was. He was, you know, well, he was from Manchuria. <laughs> but I didn't know that's what they called Cape May, New Jersey. <laughs> Where isn't he down from down the shore? <laughs> Somewhere down there. But uh, I'll never forget as a kid, his manager, as a, when he was a, uh, a bad guy, mm -hmm. his manager, I didn't see the 64 run. I wasn't, I was too little and I wasn't watching wrestling yet, but I do remember the 67, 68 run. And there was a manager. Do you know this name? Wild Red Berry. Yeah, he used to he used to shout him out on the the ninety early nineties pay per views, and I know the name, but he I have no context for it because he always used to just say hello. <laughs> well, he was a former wrestler. He was he was sort of a lightweight. Okay. And uh, by the sixties, he had retired, and he was a mouthpiece. He uh, dressed well, wore like a. Uh, a, a fedora hmm. type hat and he would do all the talking and i remember as a 11 or 12 year old when i really still believed there that, that you know some of the stuff might not be uh on the completely on the up and up but bruno and gorilla monsoon <laughs> that's on the up and up <laughs> it's for the title it has to be <laughs> and they would never let gorilla monsoon he would just stand there hmm. and going into this third match uh they were doing the interviews from washington dc and at the end of the interview and red berry is done talking gorilla monsoon just just looks over at the then announcer ray morgan oh yeah and says this time i break his back and that was all he said ever wow. and i was like oh my god you know, so it was, you know, it was just done well. And that was the first time you heard Gorilla Monsoon speak anything. He never spoke any Manchurian. <laughs> he, he didn't expect to hear any uh, Mandarin dialect or any, no. <laughs> any, any of the Asian languages. But yeah, it was, it was, it was a beautiful era. Um, 
I, I was. Uh, I got to go back to the spaghetti. Can oh. do we do we have a spaghetti update? I I called around. No one no one in this area as live events are resuming. <laughs> serve spaghetti. <laughs> At the live events. Well, and you were saying that was the 40s? And the well, 50s. it had to be the 40s yeah. or 50s. <laughs> and my dad and his friend Frankie, <laughs> once again, they would go occasionally to boxing. They didn't like wrestling. They'd go to boxing at the Newark Armory. And, you know, in an effort to not bring me to the Newark Armory, besides <laughs> the fact that it was 1966 or seven, <laughs> besides the fact that it wasn't a very good neighborhood, and uh, the father threw it, and and this is where my aunt Betty came in, yeah. where, where he said, "Yeah," and they and they used to throw plates of spaghetti off the balcony, and they didn't like the decision. <laughs> and my aunt Betty's like, "I oh, come on, Jesus Christ, Philly, they wouldn't do that." <laughs> so I don't know. It, it, it's it, it it's urban legend, urban. <laughs> and it's just it's just fun stuff. Um, we're going to bounce around a lot today. Speaking of fun stuff, I don't know how it came up, but last, do, do you know the story? Um, it's told by, Dutch Mantel tells it, but I've heard other guys like Ron Fuller take credit for the story about the boy and the donkey. Oh, do I even want to hear this? <laughs> no, it's not. You okay, okay. Go in the wrong no, 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 no. <laughs> There's well, you never know. I mean, well, here's the so I okay. told AJ this story. <laughs> I meant Ron Fuller. That's what I meant. Anyway, oh. you can keep going. You can keep going. Karen. All right, all right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, boy, I'll tell you. They don't call it the stud cast for nothing. You know what I mean? Good point. Yeah. But anyway, when I was with, spent a lot of time with Dutch. And we were in Puerto Rico, and I was always fascinated asking him about these territories, asking him about Andy Kaufman, asking him about, you know, the, these rides. I had heard a shoot interview uh, that someone had done in the early days where he was wrestling in the New Orleans, ter in the uh, Mid-South Territory. And, you know, these rides were like sometimes uh, you're going from... Alexandria, Virginia to uh, Biloxi, Mississippi. That was a short ride, like 300 miles hmm. each way. And then the next day you got a break and you went to Baton Rouge. That was only like 175 miles. But then the next day you had to go to Oklahoma City <sighs> and all this stuff. So I'm asking him about that. And I'm asking, somehow it went on to uh, wrestling for in the Nashville territory was Jerry Jarrett mm -hmm. and they would go into these small towns in Kentucky and you hear Jim Cornette when he ran Smoky Mountain the hazard Kentucky right and these roads that were like to go 60 miles would take like two and a half hours because you're in these hollers and yeah. these. <laughs> so Dutch Dutch tells the story and Ron Fuller has takes credit. But anyway, there was a show in some little town, you know, like uh, uh, a nameless, you know, like uh, Nixon's Fort Bridge or something. <laughs> and they, they're driving to this town. They're got winding roads, winding roads. And this is before, years before GPSs. You know, and the Dutch like, Jesus Christ, the road map didn't even have it on there. <laughs> so they're driving, we're driving to the town and we're trying to find this building. And it's hot. He goes, Carrie, it's hot as balls out. <laughs> and we're driving. And finally, uh, whoever he was driving with, they, they figure out, you know, there's just like one road and it's leading to this little bridge, almost like a footbridge style, but they see on the other side of this, it was the kind of bridge you'd be scared to drive your car across because the, the bridge might collapse. <laughs> so they go across the bridge and there's this, it wasn't even an armory, it wasn't a high school, it was just- Just some, a barn? Some building. Fire, for fire company maybe? Right, yeah, anyway. there you go. Yeah. <laughs> and. Dutch says, so we, we, we got there or we got there like four o'clock. 
and there's a couple people around and we go in and there ain't no there's no air conditioning and I'm, we're in the dressing room and they had baby face heel dressing room so if the boys and girls don't know what that is it's like you know the the uh, bad guys and the good guys not only could they not ride together mm-hmm. they wouldn't dress together there there was no uh discussion of any matches the referees would before the show would just bring them you know f- you know it's uh, 15 minutes and who's going to go over and the rest was done in the ring but anyway dutch is a I'm sweating. <laughs> and um, he, he goes, they didn't have no air conditioner. And the, the, they didn't even have windows. The only thing they had were like slats of wood. <laughs> and Dutch used to like to smoke cigars. And uh, he says, so I'm there and it's hot. So I'm looking out and uh, I'm looking at the bridge. And here comes this kid. It's like a 12-year-old boy, and he's riding on a donkey. (laughs) (laughs) And the donkey's just moping along. (laughs) And Dutch Dutch says, you know, I call one of the other fellows over and go, look at this. And, you know, so like where where the room was and where the bridge was, was probably from here to the refrigerator. What, you know, really wasn't. (laughs) So anyway, Dutch says... The, the boy gets off the boy gets off the donkey and um he he the donkey has like a little bridle oh. and he turns the donkey around and that says and Dutch goes I, I couldn't believe what I'm seeing but Carrie you wouldn't believe what happened next I go well, what happened he goes well the kid slaps the donkey on the ass and goes well now go pick up Ma. <laughs> what? <laughs> so, what? <laughs> yep. So <laughs> off the donkey went, and uh, Dutch didn't stay around to see Ma come back. <laughs> wow. Ma, Ma was on her way back. Hopefully. <laughs> but, right. Yeah. Well, did we? Did you ever have any animals in Ring of Honor? I can only think of oh. maybe F- 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 Cody's dog Pharaoh at All In. That's and that's got to be it. No right? animals at Ring of Honor. Yeah, I, we never I, brought in Coco Beware. Yeah, or Jake, right? Right. No, no Jake. No, no Snake. Um, no animals at Ring of Honor. Wow, right? that's kind of shocking. You had well, you, had, you did you ever consider giving a dragon to to to, to Brian Danielson or any? No, and any? we but speaking of, speaking of dragons, we had Ricky the Dragon, right? But, uh, no, no animals at Ring of Honor. Um, maybe in this, in, maybe in this upcoming decade, yeah. an animal will make its first appearance. Maybe the boy and the donkey will bring them, will bring them in as legends. I keep saying about we legends. We need the legends and more. <laughs> oh, well, I, I'll tell you, we've been to some of those towns, and one of my most embarrassing Ring of Honor stories was going through a town like that. I had a car with Okamura, who's our, our great friend from CMLL, and uh, he's you know he's been a wrestler there for twenty some years, and still in his early forties, he's still right at the top of his game, and competed in New Japan and all. And uh, it, uh, we also had uh, I'm trying to think it was Joe Hendry, Mark Haskins, and uh, Caprice, and Okamura, and he said, "Oh, can we can we stop and take a photo?" And we're of in, what? Well, we were driving from Atlanta to Nashville. And okay. He, he, we, he wanted to see mountains. So I took us uh, where I took an exit that said scenic viewpoint. They didn't tell us the scenic viewpoint was about 30 miles <laughs> of a winding road. <laughs> so all I have to show for it is a photo of myself and Caprice on this scenic viewpoint near a gondola system. Or you can't even see the beautiful valley because wouldn't you know it? It was it was a foggy, cloudy day. Oh man! So we went all that way out of, and uh, and I almost starved the poor guy out. <laughs> so, for those who don't know, Okamura also helps run CMLL, and uh, we'd been talking about possibly coming down to Mexico City. So I think I might have single-handedly ruined the relationship. <laughs> 
<laughs> that would that would be f- that would be fun to go. I would that that's uh, a bucket list thing for me to uh, you just be a fan, let alone be involved in a uh, you know Arena Mexico show. Yeah, I got to call one. I wasn't there, but I got to call one in post production. Um, I was supposed to go down, but then they switched their date, and it ended up being the same day as our Death Before Dishonor in twenty nineteen. So the hope is still there once the pandemic breaks. That would be cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, my only Mexico story is, uh, of course, you know, uh, Jethro Tull has, besides my love of the music, he has also brought me together with so many good friends, as as heard on this podcast, and has brought me to so many uh, places. And my friend Beverly, my dear friend Beverly, who... You shook her hand at uh, mm-hmm. Music Fest. I wouldn't expect you to remember. She And by the way, I'm giving Beverly a shout out because she, not only, and I am not embellishing this, not only is she a diehard fan, she said to me, and she loves you. Uh-huh. She says, Ian is the best. And she goes, how does he know this stuff? And she's <laughs> not talking about the wrestling. She's talking about your knowledge of rock and roll, your knowledge of uh, pop culture, hmm. and as well as history. And uh, she, she's astounded. But Beverly and I, in 2003, went to Mexico. There was a, a, a Mexico City tall show. They were playing in South America and they were going to do go to two nights in Mexico City at sort of a, uh, oh, let's say uh, not Carnegie Hall type, but uh, more of a classical, a large classical music kind of place, a very nice modern theater that really didn't cater to a lot of rock and roll. And we were going to go to one of the shows. So what we were going to do was, let's go to Acapulco. Oh, wow. And check that out for a couple of days. And then we'll f- fly back to Mexico City. And uh, and I was very um, wary. I had, you know, even all these places in New York with being in these you know, and we're going to eventually get to my sex and drug tour of the 80s and 90s, <laughs> right. being in these dubious places. Well, even these, the Phil Linnett story, you you going to find smack with him. Right. Like, and these terrible neighborhoods and, and things we haven't even spoken about yet. I knew Mexico City, you know, was, you had to be careful. It has a reputation. Prior to that, there was the... Um, um, Jesus Christ. Uh, <laughs> Alcapulco, thank yes. you. Well, I was leaving from Newark, and Beverly was leaving from Philly. Our plan was we were going to meet at the Mexico City Airport. Mm-hmm. Have you ever been there? I have not. Have you ever been there? Well. <laughs> and you, for the audio listeners, you just made quite a look on your face. My plane left Newark at whatever time, let's just say one in the afternoon, and Beverly's plane was leaving Philly at approximately one-ish, and we were going to meet, and we had like a 7 p.m. flight to Acapulco. Mm -hmm. Easy peasy, right? So my plane, and, you know, uh, this is a a dirty trick by United Airlines. This plane, they knew it. As soon as we got in the plane, it's on the air. Um... We'd like to make an announcement that the uh, the plane, uh, something about the fuel, and it's going to land in Houston, mm. and then we'll go on. So they knew yeah. it didn't have enough, it wasn't big enough to go to Mexico City on, you know, in one shot. So th- this, this was cell phone era, but I couldn't call from the air. So I get to Houston, and I can't get a hold of Beverly. Mm. Because she's in the air. Mm -hmm. So the plane, my plane gets to Mexico City at around, oh, it had to be like an hour and a half, two hours late. Well, now I'm in Mexico City in this airport and it's it's just like chaos. And 
somehow, and I looked at the schedule for Alcapulco, and I believe the plane we were getting on, we had had already left. Maybe it was a six o'clock plane. And the next flight was eight o'clock. And somehow I was able to contact Beverly. Uh, and I said, well, where are you? She goes, I'm getting a ride from a guy. I'm on my way to the bus station. What? I go, what do you got that? <laughs> you got to understand uh, uh, Mexico City to Alcapulco this is this will bring us back to like the roads of Hazard uh, going right. through Kentucky. Yeah, it, it, it was like this mountainous terrain. So I, well, why are you doing that? She <laughs> goes, well, I, I, I didn't know. I, I figured I missed the her flight was late too. Mm. I figured I missed the plane. I didn't know what to do. I said, well, why didn't you just wait? She goes, well, I figured. I just didn't know what to do. So what she did was, she went out to the curb and when you walk out on the curb at the uh airport in mexico city you're like bombarded by you know cab drivers mm. hustlers yeah people that want to help people that want to take your bags and uh here's this poor girl by herself and this man who was a cab driver says look i'll take you to the bus station you could get a bus to alcapulco <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. So I, I'm, I'm saying, Bev, just come back to the airport. Yeah. She goes, well, we're, we're almost at the bus station. I'll just take the bus. Oh, no. So I got on the proper plane the next flight, which was only like a half hour, going over these beautiful mountains. Well, we're staying at this very nice resort. And uh, I get there like maybe 9 o'clock at night. And I'm thinking... Oh, Beverly should show up. Well, she finally showed up at around, I just stayed in the lobby waiting for her. Um, it was good because they let you smoke cigars. They had good Cuban cigars there, AJ. So I was smoking a cigar. I wasn't drinking. And uh, Beverly finally schleps in <laughs> at one in the morning. And on the bus, they were on the bus. She, I, said, I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She said, it's not your fault. She says, but... I was almost th going to throw up. I go, why? Because it arrived. She goes, no, because there were three goats on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> there was goats, there was chickens, and the bus was stopping here and I didn't there. know the Briscoes went to Acapulco. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so we, uh, we we hung out in Acapulco. Um, I made sure to go to the wrestling arena in Alcapulco. Yeah, really? Because we went to, we got in a cab and we had this guy give us like a nice tour. You know, they have those, the, the cliff diving. Yeah. He took it and showed us those cliffs. Um, he was a bit of a hustler. Like he says, oh, I, I, he spoke perfect English. Mm -hmm. he, he, was, he was a Mexican guy, but he spoke fluent English and he was very polite. And he's like, he I'm going to take you to the finest uh, so in case you want to buy some jewelry or, oh, you like cigars, my man. You, you, you. Well, what he basically was taking us to was, uh, I guess you would call it an upper class flea market. Yeah. Where all his friends gave him a kickback. That happened to me in Ghana. Yeah. Um, in West Africa. Yeah. Same, same deal. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but I said, hey, don't, where do they have the Lucha Libre? He goes, oh. And he drove me to this building. It was just, you know, probably uh, three three steps up from the shack Dutch Mantel was in with the donkey. <laughs> so Ag Hall level. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, we we had we had a couple of nice <laughs> we had a, we had a nice time in Acapulco, and uh, we then uh, went to Mexico City, and uh, I wanted to go out. I'm checking these, you know, you know, Frommer's Guide. Yeah. You know, so this was, it was, uh, they, that was a book, kids, that was a traveling book. Mm -hmm. That's where I found out about, when we talked about Japan, about that Kabuki Cho air. Oh, right. And Ken says, <laughs> how did you hear about Kabuki Cho? <laughs> Todd Sinclair still wonders. <laughs> right. <laughs> you found out about Kabuki Cho and this Dragon there, Man. There, so there was some uh, red light district area in Mexico City or just, 
I wasn't going to go there by myself. Yes. Our hotel was right a few, it was a good neighborhood where this beautiful theater was and we were at a nice Marriott and I'm never usually spooked, but I was like, you know, and at that point in time, I knew some of, you know, I knew some of the guys in tall, they gotta be staying around here somewhere. And there was like three or four hotels. So I'm checking the bars. Maybe I'll see T-shirt Tom, the merch guy I know, or who, or whomever. And uh, I didn't. And uh, the day of that show, when we went, there were, well, T-shirt Tom wasn't on the tour. I Because I, in South America and Mexico, as well as in a lot of countries in Europe, like Italy mm. or uh, Spain, the bootlegging is so rampant. Really? That. It doesn't matter if if you're Bruce Springsteen or Kanye West, they just don't bring merch. Wow. They don't bring merch. And when we went to the show, there were tents of bootleg tall stuff. <laughs> and it was really cool because they would have stuff, stuff tall would never have, like, you know, coffee mugs. And, <laughs> Uh, poster, you know, did, uh, posters made for that night. And I'm like, how are they going to sell all this stuff? And when we left the show, they, pre they were pretty much cleaned out. But yeah, that was my, uh, I don't know how we got on that, but that yeah. was my, uh, my Mexican <laughs> adventure. What was your West at? What was your Ghana? <laughs> Where were you? Ghana. Yeah. Ghana and Accra. Accra is no, the, wait, the capital. Ghana is? Is in West Africa. It's, uh, yeah, so I was a, a, a dean scholar at NYU, and uh, I went to orientation, and they told me I was accepted in this program, and they said, yeah, and, and you get to go to Africa. Really? Yeah, it was the craziest thing. I got a free trip. I got to study over there for about three weeks, almost a full month. And um, How old were you? I was, uh, I just turned, I took, my 19th birthday was on the flight home. Well, how was that experience? It was it was incredible. Um, you really you really got to feel how I I left feeling really appreciative of the just the conveniences we have. And uh, Accra is a modern city. I'd say it's probably as big as but like, Cleveland or maybe Raleigh Durham or you know mid sized city uh, in America. But it's the biggest city there. Uh, but it's uh, so. What was the primary purpose of the trip? Sure, it was to focus on our studies, and uh, I came back and I did a project on the portrayal of women in advertising because I was a media and communications major. All right, so why am I getting lost here? Sure. Did you, were, were you going to school there? This was an additional program, so I was uh, I was in I was matriculated into NYU, but then I was selected for a additional program called the Dean Scholars Program. Okay, and so I, I, this is very interesting. Yeah, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, 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 our, our our listeners are going, boy, Carrie's really stupid. No, uh, no, no. <laughs> so, so you're in it. So you're there, and yeah. once again, what are you doing on a day to day basis? Day to day basis, uh, we went to historical sites. Uh, there is a there was an area on the coast, on the southern coast, where. Uh, there's uh, cannons, jail sites, things like that. The remnants of the, uh, it's the, it's the Gold Coast. And so the remnants of, of slavery and uh, encampments and things like that. And you go and, and you learn about the history of the area. Um, my primary purpose was to look for depictions of women's pregnancy, women's health, and, and things like that of uh, how women are depicted. Um, because prior to the trip, we my focus in school was advertising media and communications and uh that was something that was becoming a big thing in the united states the, the idea that women you know the rightful idea that that women were these strong powerful kick-ass people and uh the goal is to see how that fit, played out in ghana in terms of advertisements uh public service announcements things like that so when you went were there other kids you knew that went with you yeah so that's the interesting piece um there was only about 10 of us or 12 of us um one of the women i went with is now a cnn reporter really uh, yeah for, uh, she's a middle east correspondent <laughs> which is pretty cool uh lauren bond and uh 
she's also from the Pennsylvania area. She's from uh, Montgomery County, I think. I think she's from that area. And so that was neat. And we got to kind of do the same kind of studies and things like that. Uh, there were some fun times. Uh, we went to they're the Ghanaian equivalent of a luau, which I forget the specific name of it, but we got to do that with some local folks. Uh, got taken to the, the essentially the flea market where the <laughs> where it was clearly the guy's friends, okay. but it was very nice, and I got to buy some nice souvenirs and some handcrafted things and very cool stuff. Are you, were you comfortable walking around the streets of, of uh... Accra? Yeah. Uh, yes, I was. And I know the vibe you're talking about. Um, Accra is generally considered kind of first world. It's generally considered a uh, developed country where there's electricity, you know, electricity, internet, like the running water, the, those sorts of things. We did go out to a lot of the villages, though, and... Uh, those were interesting because you got to meet folks that that lived without telephones or that lived without television or they might be some of the happiest people in the world they were uh they were doing it right i think and uh although the the thing that i remember the most in addition to the nice people we met were uh the fact that oranges are green in ghana when they're ripe and they're still orange on the inside but the skin of the orange uh, the, the type of orange is green. It was really cool. <laughs> well, that sounds really interesting. And yeah. uh, uh, a hell of a trip. <laughs> yeah. How was the food? <laughs> food was good. I, not my not my cup of tea. Um, a lot of plantain-based food. And uh, plantain was new to me. I didn't have a taste for it yet. So I kind of tried it lightly. And uh, we had some Americanized food. We'd stop at rest stops. Um, you know, it won't... It would almost be, have you ever driven from Phoenix to Vegas? Yes. So it would be like when you get to uh, Kingman, Arizona, mm -hmm. where you've gone for two and a half hours of desert and you start to go up mountains. And just when you think nothing's going to be anywhere, Kingman shows up. And it was kind of like that. I yeah. know it's between Phoenix and Kingman, though. What's that? The town, maybe AJ's driven through it. If you take, if you go to Arizona, there's two ways there's like a, a shortcut. It's sort of like a a Route 22 with no, but no cars. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. As opposed to the, you know, driving uh, a number of miles north of Phoenix to an yeah. interstate. And there's, as on your way, there's a town about 100 miles out called Nothing. Oh. <laughs> there you go. And there's a gas station. And a little convenience store and a couple of guys and a dog. And it's like, <laughs> welcome to nothing, you know? So, yeah. It's, that's a lot of fun. I, I'm uh, looking forward to when things open back up for I, adventures like that again. I know. And then I know our, our producer, AJ, from Basan Creative has been scratching and itching and dying to get out of town. Just uh, like... Um, I am too, you know, uh, just with the with the change in the weather. I had a bad experience, uh, a bad experience, um, with this time change this week. Didn't like it. On Monday, I felt like uh, I felt like I was in the pure title tournament, <laughs> getting stretched. <laughs> you know, just a mere hour. Yeah. I don't know what it wasn't the Sunday. Okay. It took the extra day. Yeah. And Monday. As my father would say, I was deader than Kelsey's nuts. <laughs> I was just to say, who's Kelsey? Kelsey. He never yeah. told me. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, yeah. well those, that's a, uh, yeah, traveling's good. Whether yeah. it's Alcapulco, Mexico, Guyana. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. It's didn't, all good. I didn't get to Winslow. I, I know Winslow's not on that route, but that's from the great... Stand on a corner in Winslow, Arizona. Many yeah. pictures have been taken there. I did once. Do you know who wrote that? Well, it's a he, Jackson Brown song. He did it. Yeah, he did it before the Eagles. He gave it to him. Right. Yeah. And you know who's on that? I was just going to say, bring it back. <laughs> Danny Korchmar. And you can listen to our Danny Korchmar episode if you go back in uh, just a couple episodes yeah, ago. Yeah, the John Bellucci episode. Yeah, so... It all ties together. This was a lot of fun. This is a bit of a potpourri this week. But. Well, it is a bit of potpourri. And uh, we sort of teased the people last week when I mentioned uh, the dubious FFL. Yeah. Um, so 
I think we can, uh, we have time to uh, tell the story of uh, FFL. There was a guy, Radio John. Now, if you guys would have been my age or even younger, if you were someone that went to events at Madison Square Garden, people like Freddie the Weeper, who we're going to get into more, my one of my ticket, uh, one of my scalping mentors, uh, Silence Sydney, um, many of these scalpers that just sort of were always there. Mm -hmm. So Radio John was a guy that was always around Penn Station. And he was a white guy with, you know, he was in that era where uh, white guys with curly hairs would have these wild froze. Mm, like Ian Hunter. Right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and uh, Radio John got his name because he would have, this is in the era of the boombox. Ah, okay. But as opposed to the boombox, which was, a lot of uh, uh, R and B and and urban soul and music, the early hip hop, right? Mm -hmm. Radio John was blessed in uh, Black Sabbath and Iron Maiden. <laughs> Nothing and, you can dance to, <laughs> right? But he was a, he was a rock and roll guy. One of he was one of the only people I've ever met. Probably the only person I've ever met who wasn't run over by a bus, but he ran into a bus. <laughs> John drank a lot, and he had other problems. And, he had and while, whilst crossing Eighth Avenue, on which, which is huge, the one of the larger intersections and, anywhere and, in Eighth and Avenue, and not paying attention, I think he was grooving to like the immigrant song. All of a sudden, you, know, you just could dum -ba -da -da, dum -ba -da. Ah! And John just went across Eighth Avenue. Boom, right into the side of a bus. <laughs> a parked bus. No, a driving bus. How? Wow. Right. How, he how found, do you time he, that? He, he, fortunately, the boom box <laughs> took most of the blow. And, <laughs> and, and radio got knocked down. He was okay, but uh, he was a character. He was also one of the great reliable diggers. Because oh. since he was always around... And, and catch everybody up on diggers. So I hate well, to cut you off. Sorry, but... No, that's we, okay. We talked about it once, but it was a while ago. Right. Um, that's how I got started in the uh, ticket business. And if you go back and listen... You know, I think we're on like episode 32 here, something like that. If you go back to some of the earlier Last Stop Penn Stations when... And we have a lot more to go with my street ticket scalping era. But my introduction to uh, ticket scalping was being a digger. And what it was, was standing online, there were Ticketrons. That's before your time. Yeah. Ticketron preceded Ticketmaster. Hmm. That was a electronic, you know, they had them in some record stores. Right. But the good tickets for the major shows whether it was Mariah Carey or it was Stevie Wonder or it was whomever with a who, they and it, whether it be the Garden, Radio City, the Beacon Theater, and not just New York, at all venues, you know, if it was out in this area, they would line up at the fairgrounds when tickets went on sale. Yeah. I've got a funny story about that too, but um, so... At the Garden, where your your big name shows were, uh, the diggers were people that would stand online for a broker to procure the ticket limit. So most times, ticket limits were you could buy six tickets. If it was U two when they were really hot, you could only buy four tickets. If it was a show that they didn't, ha if maybe like, well, the one I did, the first one I ever did, and it was a three night stand, hmm. was Neil Diamond. <laughs> okay. Neil Diamond, three nights at the garden. Wow. Hey, Neil Diamond, uh, I've been re I've been reading this this book. We, uh, 
I read this book about the Altamont. Okay. Uh, about the stones. This guy Joel Selvin mm -hmm. and our I turn our producer AJ onto it. I should turn you on to it because yeah. the book is fascinating. And uh, we eventually watched Gimme Shelter the other night. Oh, I've seen that. And yeah. uh, so Joel Selvin has another book about the 50s, 60s songwriters. Uh, and, and I was going to. I was going to suggest, suggest it to AJ, but they throw so much information at you. But I think you would like it because you're like a one hit wonder guy. Yeah. So when they're mentioning these songs, you know, up on the roof, under the boardwalk, yeah. this guy wrote, you know, these, these, the, you, you ever hear of the Brill building in New York yes, City? Yes, absolutely. Right. That was the mecca of the songwriters. Carol King. Right. Ended up. Yeah. And, and all the, you know, so most of these songs that were these great 50s and 60s hits uh, were written by these other people mm -hmm. and given to these given to these groups. And Neil Diamond comes into the book in, in the in the mid to the mid -ish 60s. And uh, anyway, back to the digging. So you would get paid a paltry 50, 60 dollars. Uh, to stand online for a mere 12 to 14 hours. <laughs> well, if you're not doing anything else, you know. <laughs> oh, and under the worst conditions of heat or cold and uh, the, the fighting and pushing. And, you know, then the real fans, like, you know, a nice lady would show up at like <laughs> seven in the morning and there's 300 bums <laughs> and, and lunatics online for Neil Diamond. <laughs> so Radio John was was a uh, a trusted digger because you can only, you know, as a digger, you can only like run away with the money once. Yeah, because the diggers are getting the money, the upfront payment right. to buy the tickets. If they weren't, if they weren't trusted the, the, you know, because I would eventually run crews, you'd give the guys the money, uh, you know, an hour before the show. Because often when you would give them the money, they're running off to buy the drugs. Mm -hmm. They're running off to bet the horses. They're running off to drink. But you can only do that once. Some of the diggers got a pass one time because they were around. Anyway, Radio John was a, a, a trusted digger and he was a uh, a good guy to send for, uh, hey, John, do me a favor, like for Freddie Weaver. Oh, John, give me, oh, give me, give me, give me some wine coolers and you want to split a sandwich? Now, Freddie weighed like 300 pounds. He would only want to always split a sandwich. It was the strangest thing. Oh, but anyway, John, John, uh, he had some bad breaks, came from a good family. You know, no one was ever born, you know, our last stop Penn Station, uh, our title, and hopefully the title of this memoir that my cousin and I have been working on, uh, no one was born in Penn Station. Mm -hmm. Nobody. They all had stories, including the great Baby Dumplings, who yeah. called me this week. I spoke to Baby Dumplings. What a reunion. A faithful listener of our show. He loves it. He loves you. Uh, he's he's doing well. He's uh, works in a bar in, in New Orleans, which is uh, troubled by the circumstances now. Um, also a wrestling fan. Wow. But um, anyway, they want to hear about FFL. Yes, the great FFL. Is FFL a person, place, or thing? I feel like we're on Wheel of Fortune at this point. <laughs> well, she's a, she, she is a person. Oh, okay. So John would, you know, when I had my apartment in Hoboken, which we, it's, it's, we're going to get into that too, I'd let him come over. You know, he would, like, if he wasn't real drunk, he was fine. Okay. If he was drunk, you know, forget it. Mm -hmm. But he had a good heart. And I'd let him crash uh, if there was like a wrestling pay-per-view on. Oh, yeah. You know, he, and... Um, <laughs> During the bad period of NWA, I remember Radio John said to me, oh, why do they have that Shasko Watley? You know, Pez, <laughs> Pez, Pistol Pez. Yes, yeah. yeah. And, the ding, yeah. and he was like, the ding-dongs, what are they doing? <laughs> but 
if so radio would either if he had money he would get a cheap room these guys would stay sometimes at the YMCA or like Ralph the Mummy at the all night movies, the big, <laughs> yeah. the big nipple theater. Right. You just that, go theater that, to theater. Right. Bottom. But that that was rock bottom. But, or, but one of the places that he could couch surf somewhere to stay. Somehow he knew this woman, Louise, and she had a uh, an apartment. Now it's a beautiful neighborhood like 51st or 52nd Street between 9th and 10th Avenue. Oh, yeah. That's, but in the 80s, yeah. that... Well, even in 2005, when I moved oh, up there, it was still, good. It was good. It wasn't great. You still, you said, well, kind of where am I? But Well, you could imagine it in 1986. Oh, yeah. So John John would say to me, I'd see him at the garden, and uh, he goes, ah, I can't take it anymore. I'm like, you know, which could mean a million things. Right. He'd say, I go, well, what's the matter? He goes, I, I can't stay at FFLs. I just can't take it on. I go, who? He goes, Fat Farting Louise. <laughs> farting? Fat, farting? Fat Farting Louise. Oh, my goodness. I said, well, like, what's the scene there? He goes, it's no good. <laughs> so she, he, so I said, well, she, he goes, Carrie, she lets me crash on her couch. But I said, well, that's good. He goes, yeah, but here's the problem. Oh, no. The apartment, can, she was on like the third floor. And she was a very, very, very overweight woman tipping the scales at 601 pounds like he's that The great, the great Calhoun. She, she, she weighed, she probably, she was very overweight. She probably weighed like in the threes. And in the apartment, this is all according to John, there was one, two, three... One, two, three. There was four items. Five items. There was the chair, the easy chair that Louise would sit in. Mm -hmm. There was a couch. All right. Sounds reasonable. There was a TV. Okay. Essentials. And you're wondering what the other two items might be. There was... A bowling ball <laughs> and a bucket. Oh, geez. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, why does she have a bowling ball and a bucket? Yeah. And she's, he's like, oh, you don't want to know. <laughs> like, now, now I got to know. Yeah, I don't know. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, due to Louise's, uh, you know, she had the weight problem and she had problems with her back and walking. And she kept the bucket handy because sometimes, in case she couldn't, she, in case she didn't want to schlep to the bathroom. Oh, no. Right. Now, the bowling ball. Why would she have that, you wonder? I'll tell you why. Below her was a family. Now, these apartments really had like no regulations. So there was a family of people that had like 20 people oh my goodness you know and you know louise large family pardon any racial uh or or, or uh, ethnic things but this is for louise like she goes ah oh, the goddamn spicks below oh, oh god <laughs> right so but, it's not a pleasant no, person either no ah uh, johnny she goes johnny they're making so much fucking noise I can't stand it. There must be 30 people down there. God damn it. God damn it. So <laughs> she would, t at, at, when she would get really angry and the people were, in her mind, making too much noise, <laughs> she would lift the bowling ball up and just drop it on the floor. <laughs> and she would be like, shut up. Shut up. But John said, it was terrible enough to be there because in the winter, it was just so cold. The heat didn't work. This oh. was, you know, these buildings, the, these slumlords, they ain't turning up the heat. Right. And in the summer, it was so hot. But here's the thing. Besides the bowling ball and besides the bucket, 
she she uh, wasn't very mentally stable. Now I'm going to bring up a name that some of our listeners, very few, well, no, they got to be in my in my age era. But uh, there was a New York City anchor man. Maybe you've heard the name Jack Cafferty. Yes. And he was on for years. Mm -hmm. And probably in 1986, uh, you know, uh, Anderson Cooper is getting in his 50s now, but he was like, you know, that real handsome uh, five or six o'clock news guy that every station, right. whether it was in Philly, whether it was in Boston, whether it was in Sioux City, Iowa, they had, you know, that anchor man that was Joe Galley of the NWA. Right. And there's a guy like that. Exactly. Say, yeah. <laughs> and they, he not only were they good looking, they made you feel comfortable. Right. And they made, you know, they they, they gave you confidence. Um, so she had this thing where she thought Jack Cafferty was in love with her. Who, who wouldn't think that? I mean, I could see it. So... <laughs> <laughs> oh, this so poor woman. John, I, should, I shouldn't joke. I, John I, says, oh. when the news would come on. Now, you've been in the casinos. I don't know if you've been in the casinos with me and, and Nick and the Bucks when we play the yeah. Ultimate X poker game and we'd yell when the Jack would go, Jackie. Yes. It came, <laughs> it, she'd be like, Jackie, Jackie, I'm waiting for you. Now, this is so, so she's taunting the TV, right? She's talked to the TV. She goes, I'm gonna get all dolled up for you. And she'd be like, Johnny, Jackie's gonna come here tonight oh, no. after, war, after he's off the air. He's gonna come here tonight. I gotta get dolled up, you know, help me. There, there was a bedroom, yeah, right? You know, help me get cleaned up. So, Radio John, he wasn't really a thief. But sometimes he was just a little desperate. Mm. So he he would you know these guys in the in the in the scalping in the digger world when guys are broke they would say hey, hey uh, if you were one of them mm. hey Ian can you give me twenty I'm dead mm. I'm dead I meant you had no money yeah you, 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 as the as my Asian friend says poo guy dead poo. in the street. Oh, okay. So Radio John came up with this. He was just desperate. And he, so he, Louise, of course, kept her little pocketbook right next to the chair. Mm. So what does he do? Ralph the Mummy, who was... <laughs> Make a triumphant return. <laughs> Ralph the Mummy, who stayed in the Big Nipple Theater for eight <laughs> days. He concocted... Now, Ralph the Mummy was... Uh, he hailed from Trinidad, really? and he had this heavy accent. Like if you if you go back and listen to our uh, our episode of when he was in the theater for eight days, he'd said to the guard, uh, "I said, how did you eat?" He goes, "I know the guard. He, he go to eat. I give him a couple of dollars. He go to he go. I can't do a Trinidad. He he go to Nathan's. He get a couple of hot dogs, right?" So <laughs> he concocted this plot. This is how John would think. If I get someone to yell up to Louise that it was Jack Cafferty, no. she's going to get up off the chair and walk that 10 feet to the window to look out. <laughs> but who does he pick? He picks the mummy who's got this heavy, heavy, heavy accent. <laughs> so... They had it all set up, right? <laughs> and John was nervous because he wasn't, you know, I just wanted to grab a five or a ten. <laughs> you know, Louise had gotten her check. Yeah. So so he's waiting. And now the, the mummy, the mummy showing up. <laughs> and, uh, Louise, Louise. <laughs> and Jack Cafferty would have been like, Hey, Louise, it's Jack Cafferty. I'm in it. Don't, so, so, don't break. So, the mommy, and hey, Louise, Louise. So, she gets up and she's like, Johnny, help me. Help me. Oh. And he was unable, you know, so in, 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 in his effort to help Louise get to the window. Yeah. And, 
he was unable and backed away from taking the money. And she went out and she looks down. She didn't know. She goes, <laughs> that's not Jackie. What the fuck? Who the fuck are you? <laughs> and, you know, so he probably made a deal with the mummy. I'll split the, I'll split the money with you. So the last time uh, Radio John, st- when he said, I- I've had enough, um, it's a disgusting story, but it's part of the charm of the <laughs> time. <laughs> well, it's, it's she about- says, he says, I'm sleeping one night and I finally fall asleep. She would just leave the TV on. Oh. And you know, back in the 80s, they would run all night TV, but you know, there'd be a late movie. And, yeah. Um, you hear the national anthem and then free cable. Yeah. And the test pattern would come <laughs> on and so forth. And so John said, so I'm sleeping. And Louise would be like, Johnny, Johnny, wake up, wake up, help me. I got to get to the bathroom, get the bucket. Oh. And she, well, the last thing John heard as he was getting up was, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. And John said, that's it. And he powdered out. <laughs> Oh, poor FFL. Poor FFL, yeah. Like I always told the Briscoes, FFL might be showing up tonight. <laughs> and she's not She's not supposed to be confused with um, Triple F. Triple F. Well, we'll talk about Triple F next time. It's a good segue. She was a go-go dancer. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. You want to know what her, her acronym stood for? Well, let's save that. We'll, so we'll keep that in our pocket for next right. week. <laughs> wow. This has been, we talked about it all. Combating racism, sex swings, FFL, goat boy. Boys riding donkeys. Boy riding donkeys. <laughs> That's what I meant. I don't know why I said goat boy. That was Jim Brewer. Your, your, t- <laughs> your time in at deepest, darkest Africa. Yeah. It, beautiful. If you, if you, it, just a beautiful place. It reminded me of Hawaii, uh, just in its beauty, and the people were so kind. And we were inland, we were outland, we were everywhere. And uh, yeah, I would write, don't sleep on Ghana. It's a beautiful place to visit with a lot of history. But yeah, we, we hit it all today. We didn't we didn't come in with a game plan, but a couple of notes, and we took a tour around the world. Well, it was fun. We, yeah. we, we still have upcoming, uh, I, I, I've been teasing this, uh, sex and drug tutorial of uh, uh, sort of a more of a national geographic <laughs> style of the of the New York City area yeah because it's just so fascinating of what was going on in with, plain sight in plain sight and in the sex part some not in sight mm. uh but within just such a small area and uh as far as the uh the sex stuff you know you have the greatest Broadway shows, Fiddler on the Roof, uh, Chorus Line, Hello, Dolly, uh, <laughs> Phantom of the Opera. Cats. Cats. Cats is not, yeah. And inches away, uh, there's the show world center with Misty Wet and her dildo dipping beauties, inches <laughs> from Phantom of the Opera, inches from the Winter Garden Theater where Cats played. They're selling cocaine wide open on 50th Street. Families. Families. And, uh, yeah, so uh, we'll get back into some of this next week. And uh, hopefully we'll have a result of the election by then. Yeah, I think we will. I think maybe... We haven't we haven't really looked at our phones, haven't turned on our phones. Maybe by the time we turn our phones on after this recording. But uh, like you said, the Ring of Honor watch party every Monday night, 7 p.m. This week is Dalton Castle versus Brody King. Ooh. Uh, Brian Johnson versus Dak Draper. I'm so jealous of you getting to see all this Ring of Honor action uh, and getting to call it. And I haven't asked, you know, people might wonder if I knew who. Oh, naturally, Carrie knew who won the uh, Pure Tournament. I didn't want to know. Yeah. And uh, I don't. I don't know anything about what happened. I'm sure Ian would would tell me. I know he would, or I, or Bobby, or if if I could understand Delirious, he, <laughs> right. he would tell me. But you know what? 
uh, just like the fans, I want to see it unfold. You know, I had no idea about that six-man match. Mm -hmm. I had no idea about Matt Taven and uh, Vincent and right. what was, you know, the uh, the different layers of that. So I'm excited for that. Good Ring of Honor action. Please subscribe to Last Stop Penn Station. Someone finally gave us a new re a new review. Awesome. Yes. 77. <laughs> and uh, you could buy a Last Stop Penn Station t-shirt or, or a camel shirt. Um, I have to get a spaghetti shirt. We have to get a throw a plate of spaghetti shirt. We've got to find <laughs> more details about the Newark Armory. And uh, we want to thank... AJ from Bassan Creative and Eric with his upstart Discover Pro Wrestling. Uh, I got. I don't want to end the show on a bad note, but God damn it, they 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 canceled or they canceled uh, all events at Carnegie Hall until March of 2022. Oh, geez. I know. Ooh. Well, that's why we're gonna end the show. Please wear a mask in case they're going way back up. Please stay social distance. Please be responsible. Uh, you could be seemingly perfectly healthy and be a carrier of it and uh, and not know. So we all got to do our part. We all got to pitch in. Maybe this right. uh, maybe this election will change some perceptions. And, and maybe that can't that postponement will get redact retract redacted? retracted. Yes. Yeah. Let's hope so. Hopefully. Hopefully we all start feeling better soon and take care of each other. So uh, for AJ, for for Lamb Chop, for, <laughs> for Gary, I'm Ian. Happy wrestling. We'll see you next week. And you'll hear us next week on Last Stop Penn Station. We hail you for listening to Last Stop Penn Station podcast. Rate, review, like, subscribe, and share on your favorite platform. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or at laststoppennstation.com.